of a series of webinars on the uh, America Invents Act and what's happening at the PTAB. We had our first one about a month ago. So in the, in the, in the past month, a couple of things have happened, not least of which was the first final written decision that uh, the PTAB issued in the covered business method, uh, the very first one filed, that was the SAP versus Versata case, and that was uh, June 11th. So um, I'm, I plan on talking about that. I also would like to speak a little bit about uh, an issue that came up about a week ago here, and that's whether or not 112 issues can be raised um, for amended claims in IPR. And then I'll finish as I did last time with some statistics. We have an ongoing um, spreadsheet that we keep on all of the covered business methods and uh, inter-parties reviews that were filed and uh, whether or not they've been granted or denied, how many grounds were proposed and all those things. So we have some uh, statistics that we keep updating. Um, they haven't changed much in the past month. Uh, I was just looking on the website this morning and looking through all the IPRs that have been filed. And the very last one that's filed, if you go by, um, by the case number, you can sort them by filing date or case number, had a PGR, which caught my attention. I was thinking to myself, how could there possibly be a post-grant review already? Uh, lo and behold, it was not a post-grant review, so it was improperly marked. It was an inter-parties review. But if it were, that would have been a very interesting thing to talk about since it would have been a case filed after March 16, 2013 and already patented and, and a PGR already filed <laughs> in three months. So anyway, with that, I'm going to get started. I want to remind everybody that uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to um, fill them out and send them. I can see them on my screen and hopefully um, if I know the answer, I can answer it. And if I don't, I will get back to you with an answer in due course. So like I said, the first final decision was June 1st. There were two pieces to the decision, and each was about half of the decision. And the first half was spent on whether or not the broadest reasonable interpretation is the proper claim construction standard to be used in these post-grant review proceedings. I thought that was interesting, and I'll talk about that um, in more detail later. And it will kind of segue into the whole notion of can 112 issues be raised in an inter-parties review. The second part of the final decision was that they invalidated the challenged claims on uh, under 35 U.S.C. 101. Uh, like I said, the second thing I'm going to talk about is whether or not a, the, the PTO can on its own or whether a petitioner can raise 112 issues for substitute claims in an IPR. Um, we know that in an inter-parties re-examination, when the patent holder amends the claims, the petitioner can uh, oppose uh, and propose 112 rejections, and the PTO can adopt them. And then finally, the uh, facts and statistics. So let's jump into the first final written decision, which was the SAP America v. Versata case. Um, this was the, the very first covered business method review conducted. It was actually filed on the very first day, which was September 16th of 2012. There was an oral hearing April 17th. I talked about that last month. Um, that wasn't uh, overly surprising as to how the procedure went. It was most like a, an oral argument and not like a trial. And then the PTO issued, it, issued its final decision um, a few weeks ago, June 11th. So the patented issue in the SAP Versata case is 6553350, and it's entitled A Method and Apparatus for Pricing Products in Multi-Level Product and Organization Groups. So the central concept of the patent involves these hierarchies and the hierarchical arrangement of data for pricing information so that you can price things differently depending on your geography or the customer size or who you are. So one person pays X amount, uh, just like they do when you uh, fly on various airlines. You know, the, the person sitting in the seat next to you probably didn't pay the same price you did. And so this is kind of a method that enables you to do that. So you arrange customers in this hierarchy of groups and products and uh, then could reduce the need for large tables of data. The procedural background was that Versata sued SAP for infringement in district court. There were a couple of jury trials. SAP was found to infringe the patent, and 
um, and the damages were assessed. But both parties appealed. The Federal Circuit affirmed, and I believe they were found liable for $345 million in damages. So it's a pretty healthy sum um, for which they were found liable. After losing in the district court and while on appeal, I think the Fed Circuit appeal was in March, if I'm not mistaken, but it was earlier this year, I think. Um, so after losing in the district court while on appeal, they, SAP filed this first uh, petition for covered business method review under the, the transitional program. Um, and I'm not sure if any of you are, well, some of you, I think, are on a distribution list in which I send a bunch of things around. There was a proposal, and it hasn't gone anywhere, and I don't really expect it to go anywhere, probably the shortest proposed bill in Senate history. Um, this was a two-sentence bill, and it was a proposal to change the transitional program um, and the definition of covered business methods because the standard now and the definition is it has to be related to financial services. The proposed um, legislation was kind of open up the door for uh, any business method, and so therefore you can do a um, – transitional program covered business method review for anything, whether it's related to financial services or not. Um, I'll keep watch on that. If anything changes, I send stuff around, um, but at this point, it's just sitting over there. So back to the Versada case. The petition challenged uh, claims 17 and 26 through 29 for failing to comply with 101, 102, and 112 first and second paragraphs. As, the, as I mentioned last time, the PTAB has been granting trials, but not on all the grounds proposed, and this was no, um, no different. They granted the petition for the 101 and the 102 grounds. SAP wanted to move this as fast as they could, so they agreed to forego the 102 challenge if they got an expedited trial, which the PTAB granted. So the only issue um, in the case was 101. So the final decision on June 11th, the two issues we already talked about, broadest reasonable interpretation and validity under 101. So the board held the proper standard for construing claims in post-grant review. So this covers PGR, covered business method, and inter-parties review is the broadest reasonable interpretation standard. They based that on historic use of broadest reasonable interpretation that they, at the PTO typically in ex-party re-examination, but also in the re-examination context. And the rationale for the broadest reasonable interpretation is that it encourages the clear and unambiguous uh, claim drafting in proceedings where the claims can be amended. And covered business method reviews, the post-grant review proceedings, claims can be amended. So. The rationale was if, if BRI is used in situations where a patent owner or an applicant can amend its claims, then it should apply to the uh, post-grant review proceedings as well. The board also mentioned that BRI has been used for over 100 years, and there is a public interest behind that standard. The um, The board also talked about the statutory authority because they were challenged on this ground. They said, look, you exceeded your statutory authority in adopting the broadest reasonable construction, which is adopted in one of the rules. It's in the rulemaking. It's 37 CFR 42.300B. And the board disagreed with that and went through a whole litany, looked, talked about the legislative history, and said, look, the, the America Invents Act actually gave the board a lot of new statutory and rulemaking authority to the Patent Office. So they kind of delegated some of the, the um, authority to the PTO to promulgate rules uh, with respect to these post-grant reviews. And one of those rules was this broadest reasonable interpretation that's codified in Rule 42.30. So that was, an, and you know, they also said, look, this was enacted through notice and comment rulemaking. People had the opportunity to comment. They also mentioned some of the comments and some of the answers to those comments. And, and ultimately, the 42.300B says, a claim in an unexpired patent shall be given its broadest reasonable construction in light of the specification of the patent in which it appears. 
So using this standard, the board, they construed the four claims using that standard and they held that the claims were unpatentable under 101. So the second half of the decision goes through the, the whole decision making process of how they came to their um, ultimate conclusion that the claims were unpatentable under 101. And they kind of walk through all the Supreme Court precedent on uh, 101 for you know these computer implemented type claims, the business method claims, found that they didn't provide enough meaningful limitations to transform the abstract idea into patent eligible application. You know, the very first um, hurdle they had to uh, get over was whether or not it was an abstract idea. And then they walked through all these different questions you had to ask, and if any of those were asked in the um, negative, in other words, you, you could use a uh, special purpose computer, then it wouldn't, it, it, they would have found the claims um, patentable under 101. So the four issues they talked about, I think, were, well, the first is whether or not it's an abstract idea, and that's where they mentioned uh, that the claims are unpatentably abstract. Then the second uh, question they asked was and answered was that the Versata claims have no substantial practical application except in connection with a computer. The third question they answered was that the general purpose computer hardware program can be used to implement the claimed method steps, so you didn't need any special programming or anything, you could just plug this into a general purpose computer. And then finally, they stated that the Versata claims merely add insignificant conventional and routine steps that are implicit in the abstract idea itself. So there wasn't anything extra that was added to um, save the claims from invalidity under 101. So there's been a lot of discussion about this, um, this, this uh, decision and whether or not it's going to open the floodgates to uh, covered business method reviews. Of course, you still have to have a financial services related patent to get into CBM. And I think just yesterday or the day before, three or four of them were filed. Um, but I don't know if it was in response to this or not. Um, in any event, this will give people who are challenging patents probably some um, a little bit of breathing room and comfort in knowing that they can challenge claims whether in a covered business method or in the future on patents that issue from applications filed after March 16th using the post-grant review that the board is amenable to challenges under 101 and are willing to actually invalidate the claims. So I'm going to switch gears and now talk about whether or not 112 issues can be raised in an IPR when a patent owner amends the claims. So we all know in inter parties re-examination, if the patent owner amends its claims, the third party requester can object and propose rejections of the amended claims under 112. And that's governed by 37 CFR 1.906 which says that claims in an inter parties re-examination proceeding will be examined on the basis of patents or printed publications and with respect to subject matter added or deleted in the re-examination proceeding on the basis of 35 U.S.C. 112. That's also in the MPEP. Interestingly, when the PTO promulgated all the rules governing post-grant reviews and inter parties reviews, they did not have a corollary CFR provision, at least not one that I could find. So there's no corresponding provision for inter parties review. In an inter parties review under the, stat under the statute 35 U.S.C. 311, it limits IPR review to patents and printed publications. And those are applied under 102 and 103. If a patentee wants to amend claims during an IPR, they have to file a motion to do so. Typically there's a, a call with a conference call with the uh, PTAB or whoever the, um, the, the uh, administrative patent judge is that's controlling the case. They'll have a phone call with the other side and they'll discuss the amendment. And when they discuss it, they talk about, you know, what their proposal is, where the support is. And in fact, when they actually, if they are authorized to file the motion and they do so, they then have to identify um, the section 112 support in the motion. That's governed by 37 CFR 42.121. So 
So you have to identify support in the original disclosure of the patent for each claim. There's still, in IPR, just like inter-parties re-examination, there's a prohibition against enlarging the scope of your claim. Um, but what about when you narrow the scope of the claim but still raise some ambiguities with respect to 112 or raise a written description issue? Um, there's also this Patent Office uh, trial practice guide that was published back when the final rules were published, and that states that a petitioner can respond to new issues arising from proposed substitute claims, including evidence responsive to the amendment, but it doesn't say that they can respond by objecting to the claims under 112. So there don't, there does not appear to be any rules that suggest that petitioners can raise 112 issues. But I don't think that the conversation ends there because the PTAB, and I'll talk about this in a minute, has on its own already raised the 112 issue. Now that was not in, a, in an IPR, but it did it on its own without the petitioner um, suggesting it. The difficulty with the, um, the amending the claims during a, an inter-parties review is that there's this recent ruling in IPR 2012-00027 where the PTAB is taking a very restrictive view on permitting the patent owner to amend its claims. And in there they state you know, that an inter-parties review is more adjudicatory than examinational in nature, sort of saying, look, we know in the re-exam context you can amend your claims a bunch of times, but in an inter-parties review, we're not going to let you do that. And that's because their position, the PTAS position, is inter-parties review is more like a litigation than it is like an examination. Of course, this is all going to segue back into the broadest reasonable interpretation discussion we had earlier. The PTAB also said, if a patent owner desires a complete remodeling of its claim structure according to a different strategy, it may do so in another type of proceeding before the office. So what they're saying is, you're in an IPR, you're going to be very restricted in how we're going to allow you to amend your claims. If you want a wholesale amendment of the claims, then you could file a request for ex parte reexamination, you could file a reissue or some other proceeding before the office in which uh, you would have the opportunity to make further amendments to the claims. So it seems like in this decision, um, in this ruling though, the, 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 the PTAB is making a distinction between inter-parties re-examination and inter-parties review, at least with respect to amending the claims. Um, so maybe that suggests that you wouldn't have a, an ability to raise 112 issues. But like I said earlier, the PTAB has on its own issued a raised 112 issue sua sponte. In, this, in the Liberty Mutual Progressive Casualty case, that's the covered business method 2013-2, they instituted review and included a proposed rejection to some of the claims as indefinite and lacking written description. And the petition never proposed that rejection. So they just did this on their own which was interesting, and they didn't really, PTAB didn't really go into a lot of discussion on whether or not they had the authority to do so. Um, they just did it. Um, and interestingly, in that case, the patent owner just canceled the claims, so it never really challenged the authority, so we still aren't going to know whether they can do that um, until it happens and somebody challenges them. But in the Liberty Mutual, that was a covered business method, and 112 issues are permissible. So if the PTAB has the authority to issue a proposed rejection of the claims without being requested to do so, can they do so in an IPR for amended claims? This may say, yeah, they probably could. Um, they haven't yet, and I guess we'll have to wait to see what happens. But at this point, it seems like based on this decision, the PTAB could do that. Um, but then that begs the next question. <laughs> If they can sua sponte issue a 112 rejection, can they sua sponte reject original claims over prior art? Um, you know, we all know in, in an ex parte reexamination that goes up on appeal, the board can issue a, an entirely new ground of rejection based on new prior art. Um, but when they do so, they typically remand it and give the applicant in that instance uh, the opportunity to respond. You wouldn't have the same 
ability in an inter-parties review. So I'm not sure whether they would be constrained um, in that regard and probably, you know, whether or not they could do so. In the Liberty Mutual case, they actually, they noted that it was a new rejection and they did provide both parties an opportunity to brief the issue. Um, but again, you know, these are all statutorily required to be finished and completed within 18 months. So they're, they're, they're under the gun uh, to get these things completed. So whether or not they're going to issue new rejections, we won't know. Um, and whether they have the authority to do so, we won't know until they do it and somebody challenges them. So with that, I want to go back to the broadest reasonable interpretation ruling. In the Liberty Mutual case where they sua sponte issued a 112 rejection, they did so based on their broadest reasonable interpretation of the claims. But those claims may have sustained a 112 validity attack if they were construed by a different district court using a narrower claim construction. So by adopting the broadest reasonable interpretation, it's, it almost seems like the Patent Office can adopt a very broad interpretation of the claim based on that interpretation, then say, well, your claim is invalid as indefinite based on our claim construction. And it's a claim construction that probably would never fly in district court. So that's why there's this big issue about whether or not the BRI actually should be the appropriate standard in these post-grant reviews. A lot of people are arguing, especially given the restrictions on a patent owner's ability to amend the claims, and I talked about that in the idle free systems case, should it really be the standard? And, and people are arguing that given this limited ability to amend, the justification for the BRA, BRI standard, and most of the justification that's set forth in the Versata decision is, you know, you had the opportunity to amend your claim, so therefore we need to adopt the broadest reasonable interpretation standard. But given that there's a severe limited ability to do so, uh, perhaps that justification is not quite as sound as the board thinks it is. So I guess we'll have to see um, what happens. But um, at this point, that's the, that's the standard. If this goes on appeal to Fed Circuit, which I suspect it will, since there's $350 million at stake, um, we'll see what the Federal Circuit does with the broadest reasonable interpretation standard. All right, so I'm going to conclude with some more facts and statistics. Um, there's a few more IPRs and CBMs filed as of today. So we've got 318 IPRs and 36 CBMs. And if you read the, um, the rules that the PTO um, adopted, I think it was in August of last year, the final rules on these trials, they had their projections for what they thought was going to be the number of CBMs filed, what they thought was going to be the number of IPRs, and they do the same with the derivation proceedings and post-grant reviews. And if my memory is correct, they had anticipated um, 400, you know, in the mid-400s with respect to IPRs. So here we are about uh, three-quarters of the way through the year, and we're pretty close to exactly what they thought would happen. With the CBMs, though, I think they were anticipating quite a few more, like in the 200 range, and there's only been 36, and, and I don't suspect there's going to be a ton of these either. So um, they kind of overshot on that one, but they seem to be right on with respect to IPRs. Um, as of this week, and I say this week because I think um, our data is only uh, current up to Tuesday, uh, so that's two days ago. There's been 112 decisions to grant or deny a trial, and out of those, 101 have been granted. So it's actually dropped a little bit. I think last month we were at about 91%, now we're at 90%. And I think this is definitely below the um, number of reexaminations that were granted in inter-parties reexam. From, from my, uh, what I recall reading in the press, that was usually around 93 to 94% for inter-parties re-examinations. For ex-party re -exam, I think it's even higher. Um, but so here we are at 90%, and I think it's probably going to hover around here, um, up or down maybe a percent or two. But again, we don't have enough data really to be statistically significant. And in a couple years, I think we'll have a pretty good feel for um, the percentage that are granted. 
just like the last time, they, one of the interesting things is that only 22% of the proposed grounds are being granted. Um, and I think last month the number was around 27 or 28 percent, so it's dropped even more. Um, so the board is really focusing these post-grant reviews um, based on, and, and you remember last time we talked about what happens when you propose 10 grounds and the board grants on five, and the other five it says are just cumulative. Um, do you have an estoppel effect on those five? So this is a pretty important issue, and the fact that they're only granting on 22% of the grounds, I think, is pretty significant. 10% of the petitions have been denied. 11 have been granted, so that's 10% again on all proposed grounds, so it's pretty rare for all of them to be um, granted. Uh, right around the same as last month, too, is the percent that are related to um, litigation or other IPRs. It's, it's up around 90%, so it seems like, for the most part, these are being used um, for the purpose that they were intended to be used for, which was as a, a, an avenue for people to contest validity of a patent in a litigation and do so before the patent office instead of the district court. And finally, seven have been terminated due to settlement. So with that, um, that's the end of my presentation. I thought I'd try to be a little quick since uh, next week is July 4th. And People are probably getting ready to get out of the office and go on vacation. I don't see any questions, but again, here's my email address. Please feel free to email me any questions you have, um, especially as they come up, and, and maybe I can discuss them uh, during the next webinar. So thanks all for attending. Have a good day.